what were the numbers, the values that we had to compute for each one of the neurons? We had to compute the delta for each neuron? We had to compute those delta values, right, which were how responsible that neuron was uh, to, like, how, how much it contributed to the error of the network. And the thing is that these deltas, they are computed from the end of the network back to the first layer. So you compute the deltas at the last layer, then the deltas at the, la the layer before that, and so on. And uh, one thing that people realized is that because these deltas are computed by multiplying numbers, which are maybe really small numbers, these deltas, when you compute like the, la the deltas of the first layer, they're computed, they depend on the deltas of everything came, that came before. It's very likely that these numbers here are going to be very, very close to zero. That's what they call the vanishing <laughs> gradient. And intuitively what that means is that the, if, if you have really long networks, the information about how to adjust the weights at the end of the network, that's a really strong information. Like you're, re you're really sure how to update these weights. But as you move to the earlier layers of the network, that information kind of dissolves. You, you're not really sure everything tends to zero. And it becomes really hard to adjust the initial weights of the initial layers of the, the network. Does that make sense, the, what the problem is? That's what they call the vanishing gradient problem. And it's really bad if you use something like a sigmoid activation function. If you use this other one, this problem is not so bad. So my understanding is that this is the main reason why people use this. Again, because if you have really long and deep nets, the vanishing gradient essentially makes it impossible to update the weights of the, of the first layers, which are usually really important. Yeah. But I uh, still think that with Redo, uh, in like deep networks, uh, you have the dying Redo problem. The what? The dying Redo problem. Dying what? Dying Redo. Uh -huh. Right, so like, I'm not sure if it's, that's the main reason, because in deep networks we usually use uh, different kinds of regularizations to fight with it. Right, that's a good point. So uh, I'm not even talking about regularization. Uh, that's something else that is really important. I don't know if you guys know what regularization is. So regularization, if you have a machine learning algorithm, let's say you're like you're doing li linear regression, just like I showed in the first slide. We just had two input variables, which was the number of people that were online at the time that you made the post, and how funny you think the post is. In some other problems, you may have like 10,000 variables instead of just two. And if you have lots and lots of variables, you get this really complicated formula. And then you would have like a thousand weights to adjust. And if your training set is kind of small, like you have a thousand weights to adjust, but you have just six examples of posts that you collected information about, it's very likely that your model is going to overfit. Meaning there's some way of adjusting those a a thousand, thousand uh, weights that is going to get all the six posts correctly, like exactly correct. And one way of trying to avoid this problem of overfitting is called is what they call regularization. It's, it's essentially like a penalty that you apply to the model, saying, if possible, try to not use all <coughs> a thousand variables when you're making a prediction. Use as few variables as you can. That's the intuition of what the regularization scheme uh, does. In uh, these deep neural nets, regularization is really important because you have so many neurons and so many layers that you want to tell the network somehow, okay, you can use a million neurons if you really need to, but try to use as few as possible if you can. And then there's this thing called dropout. <coughs> there's a bunch of uh, techniques that you need to use in practice that, uh, that help with like making the, the algorithms more stable in some sense, which I guess is what you're saying, right? These things could, these numbers, they could either go to zero or they could explode, meaning like the, the, when you're computing the gradients, they get really, really large, uh, like, and you can't represent them as a float or something. Yeah, like, what I wanted to say is, uh, like, just change, changing the activation function to real doesn't solve the problem. It does, it does not. Yeah. That's right. Right, that's right. It does not. It's one of the things that helps making the problem less horrible, but it's not the, the complete solution. Um, but anyway, this is a, a, a popular activation function that people use. It's fast to compute. 
All right, so what do we have so far? We have the image, we have a convolutional layer. We, by, apply, by doing the convolutions, we get feature maps. We run this fe uh, feature maps through some activation function. It doesn't have to be this one. You could do sigmoid. Some, some people, you, it's like you can combine this in any crazy way that you want. Then you do max pooling, and then you feed this to the network. Now, the other question is, why did we apply the activation function to this feature map? and then lower the resolution? Why didn't we first lower the resolution and then apply the, the, the activation function? When you lower the resolution, you lose information? That, in some cases, exactly. So in some cases, when you lower the resolution, you're losing information, and then, but it's kind of like a hack. It doesn't have to be like this. And actually, if you see how people actually implement this in Apple, sometimes they they do the activation after the max pooling. It doesn't have, so that again, that's one of the main points, I guess, of this talk. When you see the actual CNN architectures that people deploy and that work really well, they there's a lot of experimentation to get the the order of these things right. So should I have a convolutional layer here? Yes or, or no? How many filters are you going to have? Why three? I, I decided three because I, I, I don't know, there's no reason. I can have five or I could have two. How large are these filters going to be? Uh, am I going to apply the activation function here before I do max pooling or afterwards? And after I do max, max pooling, couldn't I have another convolutional layer here that is going to use a different filters <coughs> over this image to maybe try to find other patterns here? Maybe I could, and that, that's actually what people do often. So how you sequence these possibilities, that's something that is uh, decided usually by trial and error. You get some like intuition, but it's not, not signed. But anyway, this is a simple example of like all the things that can be used to compose, like can be composed to construct the CNN. Does it make sense? All right. <clears throat> Some people use like this kind of diagrams instead of actually drawing the, the filters. You just say there's a convolution followed by an activation, followed by max pooling, and then like a fully connected layer at the end, and you make the predictions there. You can do more complicated stuff. You could do like convolution, activation, convolution, activation, then max pooling just here instead of here. Why? Because I tried and it worked better. Then a convolution, activation, and max pooling. So people do this, it's kind of arbit not, not arbitrary, but you have to try out to see what happens, right? So what happens after you, um, you run like the process of training this network? What, what happens? Uh, what are the filters that are actually learned by the network in the first convolutional layers? It's possible to visualize what those filters are. That's actually interesting to see. What are the patterns that this thing is finding out helps in this task of making the, a classification of whether something is a cat or not. And what we usually see is that the filters in the earlier layers of the network, they, they are filters that detect like low level features. So lines essentially, like the, is there an ascending line, diagonal line, vertical edge? And then based on this on the understanding of whether the, the lines happen in this region or not, you can construct other features that combine this information to get even higher inf higher level information. So you can combine like there's a ascending line, straight line, descending line. So that looks like something like a semicircle. So you could get a second convolutional layer that the output is is there a semicircle in this part of the region, right? And then you could have a, another uh, filter here that detects is there like the other half of a, a semicircle of a circle. And then you could have like maybe this other thing is going to combine this information about like half circles to detect eyes. So you get like this ever higher level information being detected by the filters in uh, later convolutional uh, layers. They, that, does that make sense intuitively? What is happening? All right. So, but just before I show what those filters actually learn. Let me, uh, so who creates those filters? In this example, I gave you the three filters that are helpful for determining if something is an X or a no, right? But where are those filters coming from? So 
So like those, these numbers, like I decided that to implement a filter that detects ascending lines, this should be minus one, minus one, plus one. I decided that. But the point is that the network should figure this out on its own. How would you do that? You can use just the standard backpropagation algorithm. It, it's exactly the same thing. When you're training this network, you have to adjust the weights, right? The weights are numbers, real numbers. Here, the few, to, in order to find out what the best filter is in this case, well, the filter is described by nine numbers. So you could interpret this as weights in a neural net, and you're gonna use like all the same ideas of back, back propagation to adjust this first number of this filter, this first number of this filter. So you can compute all the same information that I mentioned before. You can compute like the gradient of this first element of this filter, which is going to say, if I want to make the classification better, should I make this number larger or lower? Exactly like what we did with the standard weights of a, a neural net. So you start with like random filters and you run a few examples, like train images, and back propagation is going to adjust not only the weights of the network, but also the, the numbers that compose each one of these filters. So you go from random filters, and as the network, network gets better and better, these filters start to converge to filters that actually detect useful features. You had to uh, say how big the filters are in the beginning, or does that change yeah. the training? No, you have, that's one of the things that you decide. You decide, like in this case, I decided that the filter is a 2D thing <coughs> because I'm analyzing images. So, image, like I want to look at patches of images, which are like small 2D things. <coughs> How large those 2D patches are, that's something that you have to decide. Um, for example, in, in this case, the image is a black and white image. So each, for each pixel, we have just one number. If you're analyzing a picture that is a color picture, for each pixel, we have three numbers, RGB. And in that case, what would the filter look like? Any ideas? So like you could imagine that an image is, so an image with just black and white is just a 2D matrix. If you have three values per pixel, it's like the image is a first matrix with the R component, a second matrix with the blue, and a second one with the green. Yeah. So it's a cube. It's a cube, right? So in that case, the filter would be this three by three by three thing that you slide over that I know that it's complicated to think about really like 3D things moving in 3D, but the, the idea is that if you have more than one number per pixel, the, the, this is not going to be a 2D 2 by 2 matrix. It's going to be a 3 by 3 by 3. You can do it. Uh, anyway, so those values, they come from backpropagation. Nothing changes. It's exactly the same learning algorithm that is now not only updating the weights of the network, but it's updating the inner numbers that form these filters and also the filters of other convolutional layers if you have them. Okay, um, what types of features are learned by these filters? That's something that you can visualize. So in this example I have three convolutional layers and what is happening is that, again, these filters, they are probably, like empirically, they tend to detect lower level properties of the image, so <coughs> edges usually. These filters, they operate based on the, prop, the things that these other filters detected earlier on. So these are going to detect combinations of ascending lines and descending lines to maybe detect circles. And then if you have information about circles, you pass those informations to a third set of filters that is going to combine, ah, there's a circle followed by a triangle, so maybe that's like eyes followed by a nose or something. Shouldn't like the subsequent police be bigger then? To be able to like combine? No? What the, the size of the filter you yeah. mean? It depends on the max pooling that you performed. Oh, right. Usually you do max pooling yeah. so everything shrinks down again. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, for like I think this was an application where they were trying to recognize uh, faces, human faces. And so each one of these things here is one filter that was used in the first convolutional layer. 
each one of these cells. So I don't know how many, they use many, many filters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So a hundred filters. It's not like three. You can pick the number of filters. And what this uh, figure, this diagram is showing is when you apply that filter to a specific patch of the region, when is that filter going to be very highly activated? So, like for example, this filter here is highly activated if in that small patch of the, the image there's like a, something that looks like a circle here. Why? I don't know. Like this could be <coughs> like something that detects whether there's a sort of diagonal uh, image here. This is like a diagonal at the lower level of the, the, the region and so on. Yeah. Do you normalize the weights between uh, 0 and 1 to visualize it? Which weights? Uh, of the convolutional layer. Of the convolutional layer, no, I don't think so. But how do you get the colors then? Because this is not the class. Sorry. Class. Let's say that again. N you, to visualize it, you have to have values between zero and two hundred fifty. Oh, you mean to actually plot this? Yeah. 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 Sure. So you normalize it between zero and one. Yeah. So it also could be that all weights are negative because. What you show is only relative, right? Let me think about this. That's a good question. I actually don't know how they normalize this. You're right, because if you do normalize them, if they're all negative, it's then really, yeah. you lose some information. You're right. That's a good question. I don't know how they do it. Um, maybe they don't normalize it. I'm not sure. But anyway, the idea is that these this filters, they are, like when you look at a visualization like this, it's saying what kind of patterns were deemed to be useful after the, the network was trained. And then these filters are going to be combined by the second, uh, when you give this information as input to the second set of filters. And then the second set of filters combine these kinds of edges that are detected here to detect <coughs> higher level things of the images. So like this is a type of eye, and an eyebrow. I don't know, I have no idea what is this. This is a nose. This is like a, a mouth, someone laughing. So you get all this stuff, right? So these are the filters that are learned by the second convolutional layer. So you learn how to detect whether there's a specific part of a face somewhere in the image. And then when you combine this, on the third set of filters, you're going to get something that looks like this. So at the end, you get almost, so like this is the face of a woman, uh, this is the face of a guy with a mustache, and then that's why CNN cell. Okay. How do you visualize the higher level uh, convolutional layers? Because you have um, one convolutional uh, operation for each input layer from before, right? Right. So you add it. No, so what you do is, the, each one of these layers is a matrix, right? Yeah. And what you want to know is, like let's say it's a 3 by 3, what you want to know is what elements, like what would be the, pa the small 3 by 3 patch of an image that would result in the highest activation right. for that thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can compute this, and that's what they're plotting here. Okay. So these are really useful detectors, right? If you want to detect if there's a woman in the picture or a man, or like, or I don't know what you may want to detect, these filters are giving you really useful information that facilitates the classification comparing to if you, like if you are trying to make the same classification based on pixels directly. So you're getting increasingly more useful information as you compute these filters. Uh, if you add more convolutional layers. Okay, so far? All right, so how much time we have? 10 minutes. So that's pretty much it, actually. There's no, that, like, this thing is not so complicated. So this is like this, a complete diagram of a CNN. We have like images, and we have this, com this combination of things, like a convolution, activation, pooling, and all, what all of these first layers are doing is a feature learning process. So you're learning features, like you're learning to detect uh, whether there's a mustache in the picture, whether it's a man or a woman, whether there's a nose uh, and whatever. So based on this higher level features that you learn how to extract, 
from the training examples. You just feed that <coughs> higher level information to a standard fully connected neural net, and, and this is just normal back propagation. And then that's why it works. Now, the other question is, I was, uh, all the examples here involve images. If you were dealing with sounds, for example, could you also do this? So, like, if you're recording, yeah. Uh, so, they mentioned that sometimes you can transform your sound into images, for example. Right. Yeah, you can do that, but, and you're right, you can do that. <coughs> but, like, what you guys should think about is what is the why is this working this is working because those filters they are being applied to different parts of your input signal to detect patterns like in that small part of the region is there an eye right so what would be the equivalent if you're processing a, a song and you're trying to classify if it's a rock song or if it's blues or what kind of patterns would you want to detect if you look at small parts of the the song yeah. Uh, you could uh, you could look for specific rhythms. You could look for uh, combinations of frequencies. Right. Um, tempos. Yeah. Right. So if you're analyzing songs, probably what the filters are going to look for is like specific sequences of notes, for example, that maybe always happens if you're <coughs> listening to a specific type of <coughs> or tempo or things like that. And that's, that would be what the first filters do. And then after you compute those filters, the second set of filters maybe are going to combine this to get even higher level information. Like how are these melodies being combined to form like maybe a verse followed by a chorus or maybe, you know, so that's, that's it. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you uh, determine the initial filter. It's random. It's random. It's random. Yeah, just like the the weights in the neural net are random. The filter uh, values are also random. So, in general, in which situations can you use a CNN? Does it make to sense to use a CNN? Oh, well, any sort of data set where you want to uh, decompose it into lesser subsets. Right. So. Exactly. That's exact. That's the right keyword. So relations. Every time that the input oh. signals has, the, it has relations. So the pixel values, there are relations between them. Nearby pixels tend to have similar values, and by analyzing small windows of pixels, you can get useful information about what's in that image. Same thing happens with sounds. Usually, the sequence of notes is not completely random. If you look at small regions of the song, and by analyzing these small regions of the song, you can infer something about what chords are being played and so on. So any problems where there is a spatial or temporal relation between the inputs, uh, CNNs may help. That's the takeaway message. Yeah. Um, has there been then, like convolutional neural networks with uh, also a, a depth layer to the image, like uh, RPG-D? Yeah. Is uh, that the same thing? Sure, it's the same thing. So if you have, so in that case you would have four numbers, right? So your filters would be a matrix that is four by four by four. Or, I mean, yeah, it would be a four-dimensional thing instead of a 2D. So that's a CNN, yeah. Uh, can you use the CNNs uh, like, uh, to analyze music or the pictures or now, like spectrograms? You mean looking at frequencies instead of? Yeah, uh, like instead of notes or this kind of, just look at the spectrogram as, sure. an, as an image. Yeah. It's the work. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if people have done that, but it should work. Because you, you also have this property that there is like spatial and temporal correlation between the inputs. So that, and that's what CNNs are good. All right, any other, any other questions? So, uh, limitations. People talk about CNNs as if they were like the, they, they could solve any problem, like they're gonna cure cancer, right? And so, but usually the main applicability are uh, applications that involve images because of the obvious reason that I just mentioned, sound classification. Uh, the main limitation is how much data you need to train these things. So if you look at, for example, this is a CNN that was used to 
classify to detect to identify what object is showing up in a given picture. So if it's a container ship or uh, a dock, that's not a cherry. Um, anyway, so like people just assume that you you just need like 50 examples and the thing is going to work, and that's not true. You need something like more than two million labeled pictures to get something kind of basic work. So the amount of training data that you need is huge. And uh, so that, that's a big problem. So I was uh, checking Cora. I don't know if you know if you guys know this website. Like you can ask questions and people answer. And that that was one of the quest questions. Like can deep learning and reinforcement learning solve global poverty? Like people really have these crazy expectations about what neural nets can do. They can't solve it. That makes sense. So like what you actually can do is something like this, which sounds way less impressive. Just like a robot picking up stuff. I don't know, that's not a mouth moving randomly, that's, <laughs> a, that's a camera. So reality is less impressive than expectations. But that's not to say, like, if you look at the deep fake videos, it's, it's pretty cool still. <clears throat> All right, so that's it. Um, Okay. All right, so this is again. Now, th this value function that I mentioned, th again, this by definition, the value of a state is the largest amount of reward that you can get if you start from, from some state. In that specific simple example, you can just calculate it by looking at the two possibilities. There are just two possibilities, and there's just one action that you have to select. There's a thing that, uh, uh, something that's called the Bellman equation that allows you to compute that value without having to do like this kind of complicated analysis that we did. And it's this equation. Okay, what does this mean? I'm not going to go into details about this, but the idea is the value of a state, what is that? That's the reward that you get at that state. So like in this example, the value of S0, the first term of the sum, is the reward that you get at S0. So that's the reward at that state. Right, so that's, that's this first term. And then there's this other thing that you add to these basic rewards, like the, to the instantaneous reward. And what is this? Well, there's the gamma, but essentially what this is doing is, is saying, if I am in that state of the game, <coughs> of the environment, what are the possible next states that can result from that? from being there. Like if I throw a ball, what could happen? Well, either the ball falls there or it falls there. So there are two possible next states. And they may have different probabilities. So state S1, like the ball falls there, maybe it happens 90% of the time. And state S2, when the ball falls there, it happens 10% of the time. So you assume that you know the probabilities of what are the next possible states. <coughs> and what is, what is this quantity? <coughs> V, so S prime is like I'm summing over all possible next states. The next state is called S prime. It's the next one. So I'm in state S. I get some immediate reward. And then I move with different probabilities to some other state of the game, which I call S prime. So there are different probabilities of going to different S primes. What is V of S prime? The reward of the next step. It's the total reward that you can get from that next step state. <coughs> that's the that's like the key thing to, to realize. V of S prime, that, just look at the, what the definition of the value of the state is. It's the total reward that you can get if you start from that state. So this is the total reward that you can get if you start from that specific S prime. Right, so let's look at this. Uh, here you have two possible next states, either this one or this one, right? What is V of this state? It's 20 minus 10 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.3, right? So this is V of this guy. What is V of this one? <coughs> v of this one is minus 3 minus 10 plus 0 0.1 plus 100. If you have access to V of this state and V of this state, how can you compute V of this state? It's just the reward that you get here. 
plus how likely it is that I'm going to go there times the total amount that I get <coughs> and how likely it is that I'm going to get here and the total reward that I can get from there. Does that sort of make sense? It's like a recursive formulation. So if you know from this subsequent state that's the total that I can get and from this other subsequent state this is to the total that I can get, I can compute the V of this state. It's just how much <coughs> I get at, at that point plus how much I get if I end up here and then that's just the V of this state, it's the total or how much I get if I end up here and that's the total that I can get from, from this. So I know that this is kind of confusing but the main point is that to compute V of a state, of a specific state, there's this equation that is called the Bellman equation which uh, it's a relation, it's a recursive relation between the value of one state and the value of, of all the nearby states that I can go to. From S I can go to S1, S2, S3. If I know the value of S1, S2, S3 I can compute the value of it, Fs. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. So this is the Bellman equation. The, notice here there's a small difference. Here, this was the equation, right? Is there anything here saying what action the agent actually took? There's no action, right? There's just the state. And I say, this is the probability of going to a specific next state S prime, given that I'm in state S. Nowhere here it specifies what action the agent took. So how do we solve that? There's a variation of this Bellman equation that takes into account the possible actions that you can take. So if I'm in state S, I get a reward, plus 7. Then what happens after that? It depends on what action you take. You can either throw the ball or you can uh, run, you can do different things. And depending on the action that you take, different total rewards may result from that action in the future, in the long term. So like if I pass the ball, what is the total reward that I expect is going to happen because at this point I decided to pass the ball? If I do something else, if I try to kick the ball and score a goal, what is the total reward that I expect is going to result from that? <coughs> and that's what this term is trying to model. I'm not going to go into details about all the, de the, like the fine details about this, this uh, expression, but what matters is that there is an equation that if you solve it, you can know how good each one of the states of the game is. And if you know how good different states are, you know which states you should try to achieve, to get to. <coughs> now, there's a, a, a slight difference now, a slight different formulation of this that we're going to define now, and that's maybe the key point of this class that's going to result in the first reinforcement learning algorithm. Now, the value of a state just means that if you choose the best possible behavior, best possible sequence of actions here, this is the total reward that you're going to get. But if I just tell you, if you are playing soccer in this situation, the value is a thousand. The value of that state is a thousand. By just giving you that information, do you know what action you should take? You just know that there is some behavior that from that state you can get a thousand, right? That's all that this, is, this number is saying. This number is saying, in this situation, there is some way of getting a thousand. <coughs> it doesn't say what action you should take. So the simple way of fixing that is, instead of having a function that depends only on the state, it's a function that depends on the state and on the action that you took. It's similar to this one, okay? But what matters is getting the intuition about what this means. Like this, this is a function that returns a number, a real number. What is the real number that this thing returns? It's Q of S and A. So there are two inputs, the state and the action that you took. What this represents is if I am in state S and I execute one specific action A, which could be a terrible action or it could be a good action, could be the best action, it doesn't matter. Any action A this thing is going to return the total reward that I expect to get in my life following this action. So I, I'm, I'm here and I decided to kick the ball, one, act, one possible action. This thing, after I learn this quantity, it's going to be the total reward that I expect is going to occur during the game given that I was here and that I kicked the ball and then other stuff is going to happen. Does that make sense what this represents? It's the total reward conditioned on the fact that I took one specific action. 
which may be terrible. I don't know. In the, if it's terrible, then this number is going to be really low. <coughs> that's the that's the most important intuition, I guess, to to get from this part of the, the class. Does anyone have a question? Everybody's completely lost. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. This is the total reward. Okay. All right. The question now is. Um, Let's say I'm in state S, and I have two actions, action A1 and action A2. And I tell you that Q of S A1 is 10. So you expect, if I execute action A1, I get 10 total reward. And I also tell you that Q of S action A2 is 15. So if I'm in S and I take the other action A2, I get 15 total. What action are you going to take? Action A2, right? Because Q of the first action is 10, Q of the second action is 15. So you just, because Q already encapsulates all the long term performance that results from taking that action, when you are in some state, you just compare Q of each one of the actions. I'm going to show this uh, an example with numbers. But that's why this function, this quantity, is useful. When you are in some state, it evaluates how good each one of the possible actions is. That's the key point. Or you're going to have one number like this for each one of the possible actions. Now, the whole trick is we don't know how good these actions are in the long term. Initially, when you start playing the game, you have no idea what actions you should take. Then there's this uh, equation here, which is like an update equation. Like Just like in neural nets, there's the, uh, the equation that updates the weights. In this reinforcement learning algorithm, there's uh, an equation that tells you how to update your guess, your estimate of how good a given action is when you are in some state of the game. Initially you have no idea, but then you try things out, get some rewards, and you keep improving these estimates that again tell you how good a given action is when you are in some state. Let me show you an example of how this works. So this is a simple problem where it's like a maze, not really a complicated maze. The agent could be in either one of these cells so this, this is the state of the agent. Either it's either here or here or here. Uh, if the agent manages to get to that state, it gets a plus one reward. So like this is the goal, it wants to get there. If the agent falls into this state, it gets a minus one. So there's like poison or something here. And then in all other states, the agent always gets a very small negative reward of minus 0 0.04. So before, Okay, before I, I go into how to solve this with RL, what is the right, what is the set of actions that the agent should take if the goal of the agent is to maximize the total reward that it's going to get? And let's say the agent starts here. Not take any step. Why? Because uh, each step you will get. Oh no, sorry. I thought it was um, 0 0.4. Right, so the actions here I'm assuming are, you, you have to move, baby. you have to either go up, down, left or right. What is the sequence of actions to maximize reward? You get points for moving? Uh, you you get punished for moving. You get punished for moving? Yeah. By 0 0.8 and 0 0.4. 0 point, 0 <coughs> every, every state that you move to that is not one of these, you get punished by 0, 0, minus 0 0.04. And again, the goal is to maximize the total reward that you get. So you go, go up and then right. You go up and right, right? So you, you move here, you get punished by minus 0 0.04, minus 0 0.04, so on until you get to plus 1. The total reward is that sum. I don't know what it is. Why did you go up and not here? Because if you go here, you here, how many times are you going to get punished if you go up? 1, 2, 3, 4. Here you're going to get punished 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's one more punishment. No. No? No. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You gotta take one. One, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, and six. Doesn't make it all right. Good? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So maybe they're equivalent. Um, yes, they are equivalent in this case. Under one assumption. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it makes a difference if uh, you had the probabilities that you don't move in the direction you want to. Exactly, exactly. So there's one thing that I forgot to mention here, which is very important. Uh, in reinforcement learning, and like robotics, all that, 
when you choose an action, you are not always completely sure that you're going to go to a specific state because there's noise, sometimes you decide to move here but you sleep and you go to left to the right a little bit. So in this game, we operate under the assumption that if you decide to go up, with 80% of probability you actually go up, but with 10% probability you accidentally go to the right or to the left. So 10% you go to the right, 10% you go to the left. So under this assumption that the, the actions may fail with this small probability, why is it better to go this way instead of this way? You could accidentally move on to the minus one tile. Exactly, because here you get punish, punish, punishment. Here the correct action would be to go up and then right. But if you go up here, there's a 10% probability that you're going to fall here and get a minus one. And reinforcement learning understands that. It understands that when you take an action, different things might happen. You can go to different states. That's why that equation had that summation over the possible states that could result from the action that you took. Does that make sense? So this is what reinforcement learning is doing. Now the question is, the other question, interesting question is, if, what would, have, what would be the right behavior if you set this reward, the, the small punishment, instead of being minus 0 0.04, if the, reward, the penalty was like minus 10? What would be the solution that the RL agent would find? Again, you always have to think that the goal is to maximize the total sum of reward. If the punish, punishment for each step is minus 10, what would it do? Stand still. Mm -hmm. It has to move. Those are four oh, actions. It has to move. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Uh, right. Then you'd have to go through the minus one tile because then you would lose less than not going through a minus one time. Exactly, because you always get a minus 10. So like every step of your life is pain, it's horrible. So you get minus 10, minus 10, minus 10, and then you commit suicide and get this minus one. It's better to just fall here and get a minus one than getting another minus 10, another minus 10, and then a plus one. So the agent like commits suicide. So that happens. Uh, what else? <clears throat> what, what would happen if we change these probabilities. Instead, of, like if I decide to go up, let's say the probability of that action actually working is very low. There's a 10% probability that I'm going to go up and a 45 probability chance that I'm going to go somewhere else randomly. What would be the best action if the agent is here? So again, the, the, if, if the agent decides to go up, there's only a 10% chance that this is going to work. And there's a 90% chance that it's going to go to one of the sites. Yeah. You, then you, if you add that spot, you go up? If, if you go up, then there's a 45% probability that you're yeah. going to get a minus 1, which exactly. is terrible. No, but up is minus 10. Did you take that away? Oh, I, yeah, going back to the first setting. Oh, okay. that you have a small punch. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if I understand correctly, you want to move, uh, is it then left? Uh, so we have 10% moving up and 10% moving <coughs> down, and then there's no chance of moving to minus 1. Exactly. So if, if you are here and going back where you have a small punishment, <coughs> intuitively we could think, well, go up, right? But going up in this new setting that I just proposed, there's a very small chance that this is going to work. So you don't want to risk trying to go up and falling here. So what you do is you keep knocking your head on the wall, like taking the left action. Most of the time, you're going to go, I mean, with a 10% of probability, you're going to hit the wall and stay st still. With 90% of probability, you're going to go either here or here. But there's no way that you can go to the minus one. So that's the kind of stuff that reinforcement learning learns after you run the algorithm. It learns to balance out the rewards that you get at each step with the long time, long term rewards that you may get and considering all these probabilities of what may result from each action. Okay, you, get, you guys get the intuition of what's happening? Right. So, how do we actually learn these things? What's going to happen is, at each one of these states, right, this is a state, this is a state, we're going to need to estimate those Q values that I mentioned. So the Q value is, for this state, I need one Q value that says, if I am in this state and I take action right, what is the total reward that I expect I can get? if I do everything correctly. If I'm in state, this state and I take action up, what is the total amount of reward that I can get? So for each state, I'm going to get four of those Q, Q values for each one of the four actions. 
Let me show you an example. So if you are, you can interpret these uh, Q values as the preference that the agent has for picking different actions when in a given state. So let's say that the agent, um, you know, state two, one. State is, the agent is here, okay? So there are four actions that you can take, up, right, left, or down. So the Q value of that state two, one, up, it's going to be a number, and it represents the total reward that I think I can get if I, if I am born here and I take action one and I do everything the best that I can. The Q value of at this state and action left, same thing. Total reward that I expect I can get if I execute action here, state, uh, action left, and I do everything perfectly later on, and so on. So how do you select an action? Assuming that you have access to these Q values for all states and actions, how do you select an action? Let's say the agent is in some state S and there are four actions that it can choose from and you know these Q values. Someone tells you what the Q values are. How do you use these Q values to select if you should execute A1, A2, A3, or A4? Again, remember, what is it that Q of S and a specific action is representing? It's the total reward that you can get if you are here and if you execute this action. <coughs> You take the highest one. You take the highest one, right? What you care is maximizing the total reward. Well, this tells you the total reward that you get if you execute A1. This tells you the total reward that you get that you get if you execute A2, A3, and A4. Just compare them, you take the max. That's how reinforcement learning agents select an, uh, an action. Yeah. Wouldn't going left and going up in that case have the same value? In what state? In the previous the one. That one. In this state? Because going left will be staying still and then you can like go up in the next one. So you would you wouldn't change tile. You Left and from, right? You, oh, you, they, 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 they would probably have the same value, yes. So how do you make it sure it doesn't just like stay in two and go left all the time? Because if you keep here you keep getting these small punishments of minus zero point zero four. Oh you get that just staying as well, not for moving into a new tile? Every time that you choose an action, you get punished. It okay. doesn't matter where you went. But that's actually a good point. Why, when we model this problem, why is there a very small punishment for taking actions? Why don't we say that there's a zero reward everywhere, and a plus one here, and a minus one here? What would the agent learn if you do that? Hey, what? Exactly. If you say that the reward for any action except that this one is zero, from the agent's point of view, it could just like keep circling this thing a trillion times, it's not getting punished, and then eventually it goes to the minus one. But that's not what we want. We want the quick, quickest route, right? So we want it to suffer a little bit so that it gets incentivized to eventually get into to the goal. <coughs> but anyway, if you have access to these Q state, Q values you just at this state, just compare how good each action is, and you take the action that looks the best, according to these Q values. You just did the, the R max. So let me give you an example. How long do we have? Five, oh, God. <laughs> so maybe we should stop here. So next class, I'm going to give you uh, two examples of how Q learning actually updates these Q values for this maze, for the case of this maze. And then from there, I'm going to, see, to explain how to combine this basic Q-learning algorithm with de uh, deep neural nets so that we can solve games like Atari and uh, some people are applying this to StarCraft and like these more complicated things. Right? Okay. See you guys tomorrow then. Uh, I guess, oh, one annou important annou announcement. Uh, Charles up uh, uploaded to the website, to this course's website, a link to a Google, to a, a thing on Google Docs. I don't know if you guys seen this. It's like a, a document that has like week by week entries where you guys should write down what you did during that week and possible problems that you are facing, questions that you may have about the project. And so anything that you want to communicate with the advisors, you like write down at that document. And then we read it from time to time and it's the, probably the easiest way of knowing what, what's happening. So our suggestion is open that thing on Google Docs make a copy, like a co uh, local copy to your own account, and then share the, doc the document with us, because then we can read it and edit. Does that make sense?
Right, cool.